Imagine, imagine a church that is a welcoming and safe place where everyone feels loved, everyone feels accepted and cared for. Imagine a church where doubters, seekers and believers all feel welcome. Imagine a church of every age, every race and colour becoming one in Jesus Christ. Imagine a church of fully devoted spiritual Christ followers, passionate for an ever deeper relationship with God. Imagine a church where the praise, the worship and the teaching are truly pleasing to God. Imagine uplifting services where the Bible teaching builds up the church family and equips members to live for Christ. Imagine a church impacting the lives of children, youth and students from all areas of the local community to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Imagine a church where everyone is fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit, exercising their God-given gifts in joyful and fulfilling service. Imagine a church family informed, inspired and eager to meet the needs of the local, national and international mission. Imagine a church in which members are regularly being called into ministry, locally, nationally and internationally. Imagine being part of such a church. Imagine helping to build, to create such a church. Imagine. In my former parish of Virginia Water, our vision was, to, was built on three words that summarised our purposes. To win, build, send. Evangelism, discipleship and mission. Win people to Christ, build them in the faith, send them to do the same. Send them to win and build and send. In our Bible reading today from Mark 1, at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus, he said this, verse 17, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Here we see the order of Jesus. Build, send, win. That's because this is a cyclical mission strategy, and so it doesn't matter where we begin. Similarly, Wherever we are on our spiritual journey, there's a message here for us. Today we're going to discover the origins of a strategy for Christian ministry. I invite you to use it to evaluate your church or your mission agency against that of the strategy of Jesus. First of all, build. We see here the call of Jesus is for discipleship. Again, verse 17, come, follow me. Notice this is a passionate call. This is a command. It's not an invitation. Come literally means come here. Your destiny is to follow me. For the disciples, we see verse 18, this involved leaving their nets, leaving their father, leaving their boats and the hired men, verse 20. In first century Palestine, it was the norm for disciples to choose their rabbi. Like the way people tend to choose their church today for a particular style of worship or preaching. But here, Jesus reverses the tradition and does the choosing. He calls, come, follow me. It's a passionate call. It's also a purposeful call. Come, follow me. It conveys the idea of following as a learner, committed to imitating the one being followed. That's why churches should place such an emphasis in uh, children's Sunday clubs, in Bible study groups during the week, because it's a passionate call and it's a purposeful call. But it's also a personal call. Jesus says, Mark 1, 4, 17, come follow me. Jesus calls us to follow him, not to follow a denomination, 
not to join a sect, not to accept a theological system, but follow Jesus. Some make the mistake of assuming being a Christian is simply believing in Jesus. As a result, in much of the world, Christians have given Jesus a bad name. When I visit a Muslim-majority country, I encounter a lot of ignorance and misunderstanding as to what a Christian is. One way I try and cut through the confusion is to quote Jesus. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? Then I respond, a follower of Jesus is someone who follows the teaching of Jesus. Because if someone's not following the teaching of Jesus, they're not following Jesus. The Apostle Paul put it like this in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You see, this is a passionate call, a purposeful call, a personal call. The disciples' obedience was immediate. It says they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads you in 2024? After his resurrection and ascension in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. That verse was often quoted in evangelistic presentations, but notice it was a verse recording what Jesus said to a church, to a church family. See, Jesus is calling you just as much as me, but just as much as he called Peter, James and John by the Sea of Galilee that day, recorded in Mark 1. The call of Jesus is to discipleship, to follow Jesus. Second, the commission of Jesus is for mission. For mission, come follow me and I will send you. Jesus calls his disciples to be his representatives, his ambassadors in other places. Notice God always chooses his representatives. He chose Noah. He chose Abraham. He chose Moses, David. He chose the prophets. He chose Israel to be, quote, a light for the Gentiles, Isaiah 49, 6. Jesus tells his disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit, that will last, John fifteen sixteen. When Jesus calls his disciples to mission, he also equips and empowers them. In the Great Commission, his last words on earth, his final benediction, just prior to his ascension, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. That's the commission which we see here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he called his first disciples in Mark 1. But how would Jesus be with them forever? By his Spirit. Again, Acts 1, 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's why we're here, because they obeyed. That's why churches should place an emphasis on mission. It's the reason Jesus has left us here on earth. If it wasn't, he could have raptured us as soon as we trusted in him, believed in him. He's left us here on earth to be his ambassadors. But you don't have to become full-time or travel abroad to engage in mission. 
There are many, many opportunities to serve through your local church and in your community. We used to make it an expectation and requirement of mission in our church that if you want to become a, a member of our church, we expect you to serve, to use the gifts and talents God has given you in the church and through the church in the community. It can be working with asylum seekers, helping uh, teach English as a foreign language, helping in the food banks. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Win, build, send. To win, build, send. So far we've discovered the call of Jesus is to discipleship, build. The commission of Jesus is for mission, send. The third element comes in the verses to follow. The concern of Jesus is for evangelism, to win. Come, follow me, and I will send you to fish for people. Mark 1, 17. From the beginning, Jesus' plan was to use disciples to make disciples. Which is why the direction of this sentence runs from build to send to win. As I said, this is a cyclical but a growing catalyst for multiplication. It's not about addition. It's not about adding people to the church family. It's about training, equipping, motivating disciples to make disciples. Dawson Trotman was one of the founders of The Navigators. He said, we are born to reproduce. It's true naturally and it's true spiritually. Jesus would indeed command his disciples to do other things, but their first priority in following him was to fish for people. My father was a fisherman in his part-time hobbies. He'd often go out all night fishing off the beach at Lowestoft. In all weathers he had his rods, his flask, his tilly lamp. We didn't have a freezer in those days, so if it was a good night, we would eat fish for a few days, and so would our neighbours. In the same way, the good news of Jesus is for sharing. A few years ago, we asked our church members, what was it, or who was it, that was most influential in you becoming a Christian? The results were very su surprising. This is what we found. 27% said it was their parents. 23% said it was a relative or a friend. Then it dropped to 6% for a youth leader. 6% for a youth camp. 6% by reading the Bible. 6% Alpha or Christianity Explored. 5% was the pastor. Sunday school teacher was 4%. Another 4% became followers of Jesus through a dream or revelation. Reading a Christian book was 4%. Attending a church service, 1%. Attending a, an evangelistic mission, 0%. Through the work of an evangelist, 0%. Now I'm not suggesting our church was typical of yours or of, of how most people become followers of Jesus. But the fact is, half of all those who were surveyed said it was a relative or a friend who was most influential. And parents were the largest category. Why is that? It's because we see Jesus Christ in the actions, in the words of people who are close to us. It's because they're close to us, they become infectious. We see something in them that makes us want to know more. Next in significance, 10% attributed their conversion to a youth leader or a youth camp. In total, church-based staff, programs, events accounted for just 20%. What does this tell us? 
Well, special events are a useful means of introducing family and friends to Jesus, but they are no substitute for genuine friendship and witness. That is why it is so important we all heed the call of Jesus today. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We put an emphasis on always be prepared. You know, carry your Bible with you, have some evangelistic tracts with you, memorise an outline. But notice the verse says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. How do they know that you have hope? Why would they ask you to give a reason for the hope you have? Because they see something in you that they don't have. They see something in you that the Holy Spirit uses to convict them, to challenge them, to cause them to ask you for help to ask you, what is it about you that makes you different? Now, this verse isn't intended to puff us up and make us feel proud, but it does tell us that the way we treat other people will influence whether they will ask us, whether they will indeed come to faith in Jesus. What was the impact of Jesus' call that day? Mark one twenty seven. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This was the basis of our strategy in, in the two churches I was pastor in Guildford and in Virginia Water. Win people to Christ, build them in the faith, send them to win and to build and to send in order that others win, build, send. This was Paul's strategy, 2 Timothy 2.2. The things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses pass on to faithful people who can teach others also. How many generations are in that verse? There are four. Paul, Timothy, Faithful people who can teach others also. Four generations. Things you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, pass on, Timothy, to faithful people who can teach others also. That's spiritual multiplication. That's how to grow the church. That's how to multiply the church. Imagine what your church could be like when everyone was a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ irrevocably committed to each other, passionately committed to reaching lost people with the good news of Jesus. We will indeed be an unstoppable force for good in our community, an inspiration to other churches and a testimony to the world of God's unfailing grace, a church against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. Amen.